Thanks, guys. We are at an extremely interesting and unique time in history. You're all very lucky to be alive because you're all going to be witness to something truly magical and truly special. But to understand just how special, we need to go back in time about 550 million years to the early days of Earth when life was pretty simple and the most complicated life form was a jellyfish or some algae. But then suddenly, complex life emerged almost overnight in terms of geological terms. It's sometimes called the Cambrian explosion by paleontologists. Basically, what happened was there was a gene in a bacteria that could fixate calcium. And that gene, we know, we're not quite sure how, but through horizontal gene transfer, it ended up in a sponge. And suddenly, that sponge was able to create structures like bones or more complex structures like sensors. And within a few hundred million years, the ocean was completely teeming with complex life forms. And new forms of, um, of engagement between life forms arise, like predator and prey relationships. We are on the verge of something similar here today. The combination of synthetic intelligence and synthetic biology is leading to a new explosion of life forms and possibilities. And we as humans are part of that. Now, one of the things driving this is the explosion of big data in the last couple of years. There is now more information created in the last 18 months than in all of human history before it. And that cycle is now increasing all the time. It's accelerating. Basically, we are now drowning in data. And a lot of that data is actually generated by machines and um, agents and is not actually made by humans anymore. And all of this, this data, all of it being well organized, gives us new capabilities. It makes deep learning for the first time possible. And deep learning techniques are now enabling computers to make sense of the world in a similar way that we do for the first time. What this means is that artificial intelligences can classify the world and make sense of it in ways similar to we do. For example, an AI is now able to look at this picture and say that it's a man with his cat in his lap and the cat is looking at the screen. In fact, these same techniques can be applied even for very complex things like learning how to play chess, where now a deep learning algorithm has learned how to play chess at an international master level in only 72 hours, teaching itself. These techniques are being driven by exponential increase in transistors and the power of computers based upon Moore's law. And you'll notice that we go through different changes in technology, these sorts of S-curves, whereby a new technology enables an increasing uh, exponential effect in the amount of transistors that we can work with. Now, traditionally, we've been limited. There have been two paradigms when it comes to um, moving memory and, and bits around inside a computer. We can either use electric charges or we can use um, magnetism and we use um, electrons to store information for short duration, such as in RAM, but if the power turns off, the data disappears. We can also use magnetic media, which can store data for decades, but, of course, it's slow. A new paradigm is emerging. It's called spintronics, and instead of using the charge of an electron, it's actually using the spin of the electron cloud to store information as ones and zeros. This is a lot more faster, generates a lot less heat, and is about to change the, um, the rate of uh, computing power um, to another order of magnitude. Further developments, such as neurosynaptic chips, enable a modeling in hardware of neurons 
For example, this, um, this chip created by IBM has roughly the same amount of neurons as a bumblebee. Now, they're simplified neurons, but they're neurons nonetheless. And again, this is powering an ability to simulate life or simulate animal cognition on a basic level for the first time in history. In fact, today, you can even use the Open Worm project to simulate a C. elegans worm inside a tab in your web browser. Our understanding of neurons is about to get a lot more complex. For example, um, this new technology uses a, uh, an ionic fluid, which can change density if you pass a current through it. And it's kind of like a wave against shore, and over time it can generate a stronger effect. What this means is that this is kind of like a, a transistor that is able to learn and compute at the same time. And being able to learn and compute in one is one of the unique characteristics of neurons itself. In the 19th century, we got uh, water into our homes for the first time. And in the 20th century, we got electrical power. Now, intelligence is becoming a utility, something that we can tap into at will to change how we relate to our world. It's powering new capabilities, like an ability to analyze a DNA sample and create a photo fit from it. In fact, this technology is now being applied in places like Singapore in order to uh, create a photo fit of people that leave litter behind. Beyond just making sense of the biological, we can spit it back out again. This is a bioprinter that is able to print in um, collagen, for example, or even um, bone, and to, to spit out uh, in 3D printing of, uh, of biological material. And in fact, we can apply these same techniques to create in vitro meat, so that's 3D printed meat, which has plummeted in its costs. A couple of years ago, a patty like this would have cost $300,000, and now it's down to less than $100. Pretty soon, this will be in your supermarkets. But we can go way, way, way lower in terms of scale. And we can use techniques such as DNA origami. That's using DNA itself as kind of like Lego blocks to build stuff out of. And we can create very complex structures, such as logic gates, outside of DNA. And beyond that, we can actually create nanobots today. There are pilot studies now where these nanobots, being made out of DNA origami, are able to circulate in a bloodstream and detect leukemia cells and destroy them. This is not science fiction, this is fact. Furthermore, we can create the smallest possible semiconductor, a tiny, tiny little um, chip, if you will. And we can create them in a factory, or we can engineer a virus to create these electronics for us. This is the M13 bacteriophage. It's a, it's a virus that, that infects bacteria. And scientists love to hack around with its DNA. And one of the things we can do is to create these quantum dots, these little semiconductors, out of viruses itself. We can use an arguably living thing to create electronics for us. And we're now discovering that bacteria are much more like electronics than we realize. There are some bacteria that, instead of eating sugar, like practically all living things, they are actually eating electrons. And if you look closely, you'll see that there are little wires. These are nanowires, whereby the bacteria is, is, uh, is finding electrical potential that it can eat in order to generate itself. If we come back to our M13 bacteriophage, we can use it to generate power. If you ever use a, a clicky cigarette lighter, the click, the, the spark, is generated using something called piezoelectricity. And we can use a similar effect within the bacteriophage to actually generate power. Basically, you can have a tiny little electrical generating turbine in your bloodstream. 
the smaller we go, the lower down we go, the more we see that machines and life have very, very similar structures. It's right down in the very structure of our bones we see the structure of skyscrapers. In fact, we can replicate biological principles within synthetic elements. For example, this leaf. This is a leaf which has been um, plastinated and it's, uh, it's impregnated with chlorophyll, and this artificial leaf can then generate oxygen, just like a living leaf does. And we can look at how the natural world operates, and we can use biomimicry to create similar techniques. For example, in the little um, mosquito-style robot. Or we can use the techniques that we've learned here, and we can apply them to the living world. Here, for example, we can take a cockroach, and we can connect electrodes to the cockroach's antenna. And we can then apply a very small PCB to that. We glue it to the back. And we can then harness animal intelligence for our own purposes. So now with this control board, which is now cyborgly uh, fused with the cockroach, we can now control the cockroach's behavior. You can download all of the techniques to do this at home if you like. And there's even an app for that. The next stage is to create born cyborg creatures. This is some research done by DARPA, whereby they have implanted in pupa before a moth is even born, um, they're now creating these cyborg organisms. We can also use direct brain control interfaces to control robots that do not require uh, manual manipulation. We can simply use thought to drive another object, be it synthetic or be it organic. And we are not unique in our capability as humans to control, like a zombie, other creatures. How many of you were at the upgraded dinner last night, where we had the, the fantastic um, superfoods? Well, one of those superfoods was, was cordyceps, which is a, a fungus that actually grows on insects, and it, it takes over that organism and um, changes its behavior. And we are, in fact, subject to similar organisms. We, many of us in this room, actually have a parasite in our brain that has laid eggs in there and controls how we operate. It's called Toxoplasma gondii, and it's supposed to be only in rats and cats, and the, the virus infects rats and makes them attracted to the urine of cats, and so they end up chasing the cat and being eaten and creating this life cycle. But sometimes, those organisms end up inside us, and they change our behavior. For example, people infected with Toxoplasma gondii are much more likely to have car accidents. They're much more likely to suffer from schizophrenia. And it, in fact, seems to reinforce sex roles, so that women become more sort of open and cuddly, and men become more uh, stoic. And it makes us wonder, who is the real puppet master? You know, we, we think of ourselves as, as the top of the food chain and the masters of the, of the human domain. And yet, the more that we learn, we recognize that we are actually considerably more deterministic than we might have at first realized. The more we learn, the more we see that life imitates machines and machines imitate life. Here's a nice little example. This is a tiny, tiny little robot which is powered by heart cells. And this robot can then walk based on uh, harnessing muscle cells um, with plastic. Here's another example. We have a tiny little robotic sperm. 
Now, it's about 40 times larger than, than a sperm cell, but it operates in the exact same principle. Um, in fact, the, the, the plastic here is used in, in McDonald's uh, french fries, which is, which is kind of bizarre. Um, but here we can apply heart cells in order to drive it um, with little flagella, just like, a, just like a sperm cell. So we have robots. We have robots that can operate within our very bloodstreams. And there are new ways of, of moving things around for the first time, for example, moving drugs. This is something called a, a micromotor or a microengine. It's kind of like a little rocket, and it's, uh, it's based out of um, nanomaterials that uh, basically eject stuff like a rocket. And what it means is that we can use it kind of like an earth mover. We can move around drugs uh, within a bloodstream for the first time. And we can direct them. We can direct them using light, using electromagnetism. We can actually move these little things around um, with considerable precision. And it's unlocking new capabilities. Well, what I find perhaps most intriguing is using biology itself to do computation. This is a Sierpinski gasket. It is a, well, it's a recursive mathematical structure, but it's built out of very simple um, rules. And, well, it kind of reminds me a bit of, of Pink Floyd every time I see it, but um, what we can do is we can apply the same rules in this Sierpinski gasket to the combination of DNA. And so we can use the combinational capabilities of DNA to do computation for the first time. We can create this structure using DNA itself. And we can create new transistors that are biological in basis. They're called transcriptors. And if you put these transcriptors together, you can create logic gates. They're called bill gates. Not this guy. <laughs> Boolean integrase logic gates. Scientist joke, I think. But beyond just logic and computation, we can use DNA for storage. In fact, a dollop of DNA the size of this ladybug can carry between 200 and 300 terabytes of uncompressed data. And remember that, um, that deluge, that flood of, of data that I, that I mentioned earlier. Being able to encapsulate this within DNA means that we can be our own walking hard drives. If we want, we can have extra chromosomes that carry all of our living memories within us. But not just our lives, maybe our ancestors. What would it be like to be able to relive the memories of your grandparents within you? And I'll leave you with this final Interesting thought. If we can capture all of this data and store it within us, can we move it around? Well, more than 150 years after the first publication of Gray's Anatomy, we're still discovering new organs within the body. This one is called the primovascular system, and it's a network that connects all of the different organs, and it's used for stuff like immunomodulation. But if we look at that network very closely, we see that it is surprisingly similar to optical fiber. In fact, these little conduits are bunched together very much like fiber optics. We come pre-wired with our bodily ethernet from birth. And we can do more than just send information along this network. We can connect to it. This is something called a P-dot cluster. It's a nanotechnological technique that enables you to basically connect the biological and synthetic together to run data across biological and synthetic lines all in one. And as we begin to understand the human brain to a greater and greater extent, we can connect the organic with the synthetic to create a truly hybrid consciousness. What this means is that if you wanted to play piano like Chopin, there's an AUG for that. You can download that to your consciousness, 
and dynamically update how your brain operates. All of you grinders here, this is where we're heading in the next 30 to 40 years. It would appear that the destiny of human beings is to become as living, breathing computers. And I want all of you to bear that in mind as we hear fantastic talks today about what is achievable in the present and what will be achievable in the near future. Thank you so much indeed. I think we have time for some questions. Does anyone have some, have some burning questions to begin with? Yes, Max. Yeah, I'm curious what you think of the, uh, maybe not something you address, but the microtubule hypothesis for consciousness. Uh, do you think it's important as a board structure? Do you think it's crucial to consciousness? Or is it really an irrelevant area? I think that as we become more like machines and machines become more like us, we will begin to understand how physics in, is in many ways um, digital, and there are digital aspects to physics. And I think that, uh, that, that, that this is one way that we can begin to understand whether uh, hypotheses like, like microtubules um, have weight or not. I personally don't have an opinion on that, um, but I do know that as we become more digital as, as creatures, we are likely to have a better understanding of digital physics. Next question. Yes. I think it's likely to, to happen. I think that the, the rapid advancement in synthetic biology is likely to really freak a lot of people out. And I think that there's going to be a Sputnik moment where a lot of people suddenly recognize what is possible and what people are actually doing. And you know, th th that, might be, that might be something that, uh, that the world's biggest uh, technology companies suddenly bring out. It could be a terrorist incident. Something is going to set it off. And I think there may be um, a kind of a backlash by, by bio-Luddites or bio-conservatives. Bio In the long term, I don't think it's going to make a significant difference. But one of the things that does worry me is if it's over-regulated, then it could mean that a lot of people miss out on the possibilities of these technologies. Um, because of what I call the, uh, the, the Trabi effect. Um, in, uh, in East Germany, for example, there was the Trabant, right? The, the Trabant was like this, this public car that was available for everyone in theory. Um, but that meant that it was... Your options were limited to basically the, the Trabant or nothing. And I think that over-regulation of these kinds of techniques could lead to... Um, people suffering uh, with Trabants instead of a biological iPhone, right? You know, you, you can only get, like, a certain level of iPhone, you know? Even if you're uh, a billionaire, you can only get um, a certain level. Uh, and I think that overregulation is likely to increase potential gulfs uh, of inequality in society. Next question? Yes. Um, I've seen the sort of cyborg kind of thing before with a, with a rat where they, I think slightly different, but they basically implant some neurons onto a certain, onto the pleasure sense of the brain. Yes, um, the dopamine, and it just keeps... Yeah, and it just goes to the light, and they shine a green light, and it goes for it, otherwise it's not bothered. And they said the, the good things about that are they could basically put up the same kind of thing on maybe the area of the brain that controls Alzheimer's, that, but the bad side of it is we could end up with a sort of 1984 system. Uh, it's, it's the same kind of thing. Like, I mean, 
if uh, North Korea got hold of it, it might not be good. What, where do you see the line, like, in this controlling kind of technology? I think all advanced technologies have the capability to be used for good or to be used for evil. And uh, we see that with you know, telecommunications and uh, uh, alphabet agencies doing freaky stuff with our data and spying on people. Um, but at the same time, the access to information that we have today is leading to a, a renaissance within, within society and it's enabling technologies like the ones I just mentioned. I think that the best defense against oppression is for everybody to have equal access or equal opportunity of access to these kinds of technologies. And I think that when technologies are reserved for only a few, um, for a sort of natural state monopoly on it, um, I think that's probably the most dangerous outcome. It's kind of like if people are, in theory, capable of generating a synthetic biology virus that's capable of doing really nasty stuff, the best way to counteract that is to have your own synthetic immune system, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of the ultimate defense. So I think that a quality of access leads to a safer world overall. Any other questions? Max, yeah. yeah It's a great point. Um, mathematically, we can make projections about when certain things will be capable, but as you say, um, humans have wonderful ways of throwing spanners in the works and upsetting even the best uh, of projections. I think that the technologies will happen one way or another, and even if they may, may be banned within um, most nation states, I think that you know, somebody will just set up uh, a boat somewhere that uh, the people can come and access these technologies within international waters. Um, I think one of the most interesting examples of this is the organization uh, Women on the Waves, which basically is a, is a floating abortion clinic and provides access to those kinds of services in nations where otherwise it's inaccessible. I think that the more that governments try and clamp down on this stuff, um, the more opportunities there will be for uh, enterprising people to create new ways of, of accessing these technologies. So I don't think that in the long term it's likely to be stamped out, although certainly um, maybe the projections might be delayed by a few years. Oh, uh, yes. I'm wondering, have you seen Yes, I have, yes. Well, that's, that's a really interesting idea, right? This, this idea that instead of having our consciousness locked within uh, a couple kilos of, of jelly, that we can escape the confines of our body and enter an, uh, an unlimited space for our minds to wander. I think that ultimately, yes, with the technologies that, that can link the organic and the synthetic together, I think we will achieve that. Uh, probably not for many decades, but I think it is definitely achievable. The question is, if we escape death, if we escape aging, if we have unlimited access to memory and information and intelligence, we basically leave behind all of the elements of the human condition, right? Our, our limitations, the things that we all have to deal with as we, as we grow older or, um, you know, we reach the natural bounds of our capabilities. 
although I love it that everyone here is, is fighting to try and extend those boundaries a little bit. So if we leave behind the human condition, what are we? We're no longer human, we are post-human. But what does that mean? And yeah, like, how are we going to manage people that want to be post-human and people that don't want to be? That's going to be a very interesting society when we have two different groups. You know, some people that are accelerating way ahead into uh, a true transcendent consciousness and other people that are very happy just like uh, living a normal life, kind of like we do today. I think that's going to be a very interesting problem to address. I think we might have time for one last question. Yes? yes? Yeah, um, so how do, we, how do we use these technologies for good in ways that improve the world? I think one of the most interesting problems of, of human beings is the amount of biases that we have. Um, we are these little, uh, little machines that have heuristic impressions of the world. We, we don't really think consciously much about what we're doing. Um, we kind of sit on top a whole bunch of other processes that um, follow assumptions rather than making new calculations about stuff. And whilst that's fast, it's not always accurate. I think that one of the most interesting um, potentials for humanity is to overcome a lot of the biases that we have and to be able to enjoy the world in a much more objective way. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much.